All right, welcome uh, to module number 25. This is going to be the last module in the optimization material. Recall that in modules 23 and 24, first we were talking about convex optimization and after that, uh, integer programming. Now, when we were discussing convex optimization, we had a convex function. We were optimizing it within a convex set, a convex range, and uh, with that type of uh, constraint, there's a single global optimum. That makes things very convenient. And what we're going to be seeing now is that uh, things are less convenient when the function is uh, non-convex. So of course, uh, many functions are well approximated as linear, many functions, more functions are well approximated as convex because uh, linear is a subset of convex. Um, and if the function is convex, there's a single uh, local minimum. But here we have uh, an example illustrated where the horizontal axis is W, the vertical axis is J of W. Uh, J is often notation for some uh, cost function or utility function. And we, we see that J of W is non-convex. It goes up and down. It has a local minimum, but it then has a global minimum. And imagine that your solution is this blue ball and it's kind of, it's bouncing around and uh, it can get stuck in a global, in a local minimum. Now, if it gets into uh, a global minimum, it'll probably stay there as long as it's not bouncing around a lot. But a local minimum is problematic. So the problem with non-convex functions, non-convex optimization, is that a local minimum need not be the global one, and various algorithms could get stuck in a local minimum. So this becomes more, more difficult. So you might kind of feel this might be hopeless. What do we do? Well, maybe we can initialize an algorithm many different ways, uh, but what if each of them gets stuck in a different local minimum? Yeah, we can choose the best, but you know, there could be a lot of local minimums. And this, is, this problem is especially pronounced. This is especially challenging in, in higher dimensions. In higher dimensions, we often have functions that along each snapshot, along a single dimension, there may be just a few local minimums, but overall in a higher dimensional type of geometry, there may be a ton of uh, different minimums. So this, this could be a very complicated easily. Okay, so even if you run it a hundred times, you might end up being very far from the global minimum. So a possible way to solve that with, with pros and cons as usual, trade-offs are a key part of the course is Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is often called MCMC. It can be used to solve some non-convex problems. And the main idea is that you have an expression E of X for the energy that corresponds to a possible solution X. And this energy is analogous to a statistical physics problem. And in statistical physics, we have properties of large scale systems that large scale systems tend over time to go to good low energy solutions, uh, but, but sometimes not. So MCMC is uh, probabilistic uh, in nature. We have a distribution for the signal X. It's Z times the exponent of minus S times E of X. So let's discuss these different terms one by one. X, as I said, is the actual, the signal, that what we're trying to optimize, or you could call it the optimand, okay? Z is some type of normalization term. You can assume that given, given S and E, Z can be computed. So uh, I don't want to say completely unimportant, but le less important. Just it makes, sure, it makes sure that the probabilities over all the X's sum or integrate to one, meaning that it's, a, it's a, an appropriate probability distribution function. So the important things are in the exponent. The probability of X is proportional to the energy of x multiplied by negative s. Now, s is analogous to inverse temperature. So let's, let's think about what's happening here. If the temperature is high, then s is inverse temperature, then s is small. And because of that, we're going to have exponent of negative small number times the energy function. And even if the energy function is quite a bit larger than the minimum, 
multiplying it by uh, a small negative, a slightly negative number means that, you know, we're taking e to the negative not that much, and there's a, a weak pull toward lower, lower energies. On the other hand, if we have a low temperature, low temperature means large S. So let's now compare uh, E1 and E2. So E1, or rather, let's say E of X1 and E of X2. Let's, let's discuss what's, what's happening here. And suppose that uh, X1 is the true min, and X2 is, differs, uh, it differs from X1. Because it differs from X1, and we're assuming that there's a, a single global minimum, it means that the energy function of X2 is bigger than the energy function of X of X1. And we want to get to X1, but we're not there. We're at X2 instead. And now let's compare the probability of X2 divided by the probability of X1. So ideally, we'd like X1 to have a much higher probability because we're going to be generating the next version of X from this distribution, okay? So ideally, we'd like the next, uh, the next version to have a, uh, to really pull us toward X1. So what's the probability of X2 divided by the probability of X1? It's exponent of minus S E of X2 divided by exponent of minus S E of X1. Now, exponent divided by exponent is equal to the exponent of the first expression minus the second expression. So it's exponent of minus S E of X2 plus S E of X1. Now recall, well, through algebra, first of all, this is the exponent of minus S times E of X2 minus E of X1. Now recall, E of X2 minus E of X1 is a positive number. So this is the exponent of minus s times positive number. And as s becomes larger, which really means a small temperature, it means that the exponent of negative s times positive negative number, a larger s times positive number, exponent of a large negative number becomes small. So the probability of continuing to be in x2, this incorrect place, is very small. And we have a pull toward x1. And we're using, we're using uh, this distribution to make modifications in x2. In particular, the the Gibbs distribution is we're looking at one location in a sequence X. X is multidimensional, so we have one entry in X. And we're taking the marginal distribution over just that location. Everything else is frozen. And we're sampling from the Gibbs distribution. And initially, we're at a high temperature. And because of that, the differences between the higher and the lower energies in terms of the distributions are gonna be very minor differences. And as we reduce the temperature, the differences are gonna be uh, more severe. Now, at the beginning, at, at high temperature, you can imagine, and this is very similar to uh, uh, in statistical physics when you're, uh, when you're cooling something into a cr crystal. At the beginning, you have a disordered material. It's high temperature means that everything is bouncing around. All the molecules are bouncing around and you're making a modification to the state of one location in the material, and your molecule is bouncing around. It's very random. And as you move to a, a medium temperature, there's starting to be more structure, and you're not, your, your probability distribution function 
for regenerating for the marginal of the individual location that you're looking at in X becomes a, a somewhat sharp PDF. So you're attracted to uh, the low energy situations. And as you cool, you're increasingly attracted. So initially at the lower temperatures, even at the mid temperatures, that you could have gotten stuck, uh, you could have gotten stuck uh, in a local minimum. Uh, but because we are slowing down the temperature very slowly, the probability of getting stuck in a local minimum uh, goes away over time. And we're gradually, we're attracted to the map to the global minimum. Okay, so the key here is to cool very slowly. So some questions. Do we sample the entire sequence X? Do we generate the entire sequence X each time? Not, not necessarily. As I said, we can consider regenerating one location XI at a time. And we only need to calculate the marginal distribution for XI. Um, is MCMC guaranteed to convert to the global minimum? So uh, maybe. You need to cool very slowly to have uh, performance guarantees. And cooling very slowly, recall that you're only modifying a single XI at a time. Uh, you need a ton of iterations. Uh, so to actually get any guarantees, you need an exponential number of iterations. So uh, not, not, not really that useful. So the question that you may have is, well, if it takes such a long time, is it any good? Well, the answer is that it, it depends. MCMC is very slow. It can converge the global minimum in a reasonable period of time. Uh, it's definitely, um, it has a tendency not to converge to the bad local minimums at first, because at first the temperatures are not too cold. And there are acceler acceleration techniques. So overall, it's uh, an, a complicated area. So having completed MCMC, that's one type of optimization algorithm uh, for non-convex functions. Another approach is the, the EM algorithm. So in the EM algorithm, we're iterating over two steps, an expectation step, which is denoted by E, and a maximization step denoted by M. In the expectation step, we create a function for computing the expected log likelihood based on current parameters. So we have parameters and we're calculating something, we're taking expectation. And in the maximization step, we're updating the parameters. And of course the details are coming up. So let's, let's work through the details. We have uh, a model that generates the data X and we have latent variables Z. Now, we know X, but we, we don't know Z. So we have parameters. The parameters are theta. And we want to calculate L of theta, semicolon X and Z. So this notation means the probability of X and Z conditioned on theta. Now, the correct way of doing things, ideally, we'd like to calculate the probability of x conditioned on theta, okay? And then we would find a, a good theta. And we can do that by integrating over the expression above L of theta xz, which is the probability of x joint with z conditioned on theta, integrating over all the dz's. So when you integrate over all the dz's, you get the probability of x conditioned on theta. Uh, but this might be computationally intractable uh, because, you know, in many cases, it's hard to do things in closed form and Z will often be a sequence and it may be a discrete sequence, in which case you need to sum over a combinatorial number of possibilities. So the challenge here is that we want to calculate L theta X and based on that, we want to optimize the parameter but it's computationally intractable, hence it motivates EM, which is a trick to optimize it. So here's the trick. In the expectation step, we're gonna be calculating the expected value of the log likelihood for the parameter theta T. Theta T means the parameter in the current iteration T. And Q of theta conditioned on theta T is the expected value of the log 
of the L expression that we saw in the previous slide. And the expectation is expectation over Z conditioned on X and the current value of the parameters, theta T. So Z is typically discrete latent variables and we freeze the parameter theta t, and given that we froze them, the sequence z can be found. And there are different ways how to do this. Oftentimes, you can, uh, you can do this in a fast way using uh, dynamic programming. And after you've found a good z based on theta, in the next step, you're finding, uh, you're recalculating theta t plus 1. So recall, you froze theta t, and now for iteration t plus 1, you're taking the argmax of all the thetas over this expression Q of theta conditioned on theta t. So as an example, I just want to show you where this is useful. Uh, one example where the EM algorithm has been used quite a lot is in uh, Gaussian mixture models. So what's a Gaussian mixture model? We have a model for x such that instead of a probability density, which is a single, uh, a single Gaussian PDF, we have a summation over alpha i multiplied by a uh, probability density, a Gaussian probability density function number i, where its mean is mu i and its standard deviation is sigma i. So we have different components and component i has a probability alpha i, a mean value mu i and a standard deviation sigma i. So for example, what we're plotting here is uh, a GMM, a Gaussian mixture model with two components. The horizontal axis is the value. The vertical axis is the, the height of the PDF, the probability density function. And we have two components in green. And uh, if we sum them up, we'll get something like the blue model. And in red, in dashed red, we had an estimated model and in this plot, it's trying to show that using an EM algorithm, uh, the estimated model is very close to the mixture model. Now, you might be asking yourself, what's so special about these Gaussian mixture models? Are they, are they any good? So, so here's the thing. Are there going to be applications where something is exactly a Gaussian mixture model? Uh, possibly. For example, we're going to learn about classification as part of machine learning in a few modules. And in the ex one of the examples that we'll be discussing, yes, the, a Gaussian mixture model uh, is going to appear there. However, what about real world data? So it's unlikely that real world data will be exactly having this form, but many distributions can be well approximated by a, by a GMM. Uh, in principle, if you have a one dimensional, one -dimensional uh, PDF, in principle, uh, you can model almost everything with a GMM, and oftentimes with three, four uh, components, you can get a pretty good, uh, pretty good approximation. Now, of course, uh, real-world data is often multidimensional, and things become more complicated. Uh, earlier, I had a bullet point where you may need a covariance matrix between different components, but, but overall, there's a trade-off here where as you increase the number of components, the accuracy of a GMM model improves. So with that in mind, let's think about, let's consider how to optimize a GMM in light of the expectation maximization algorithm. The challenge with GMM is that oftentimes the parameters alpha, mu, and sigma are unavailable. Recall, alpha is the probability of the component i, mu is its, its mean value, its average location, the height, or rather, uh, the location of where that Gaussian blob is highest, and sigma i is the standard deviation around mu. We want to estimate from the data x these different parameters. So to keep it simple, imagine that we have n samples. Okay, x our data is in Rn, and we're going to have a latent variable z, and z in uh, z in z for integers, it are going to be labels for each of the x's. Each xn has a corresponding zn that tells us which of the components does xn belong to. Suppose to keep it simple, there are three components, so each zn is going to be either one, two, or three. So now what we're going to do, the e step 
we're going to be computing a sequence z given the parameter. So given alpha i, mu i, and sigma i for the three parameters, i equals uh, 1, 2, and 3, we're going to calculate what's a reasonable latent sequence. And in the second step, we're going to optimize the theta, the parameters, given z. And we're going to move back, back and forth. So once, once we move over back and forth a few times, typically we'll have uh, a good estimate for this triple. All right, so that's the end of uh, module number 25. This is the end of the optimization materials. And in the next module, we're going to start talking about machine learning.